But uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. I was thinking about uh, the weather this week. Uh, back in the early 90s, my wife and I were living on the East Coast, and my wife is from East Texas, uh, deep East Texas, if you're uh, looking on a map. Um, and uh, she wanted to go home for Christmas. So we, uh, we had one child at the time, my son. We packed him up and all the Christmas gifts and, and everything. About 1,400 miles, about 20 hours. And so we left uh, kind of in the afternoon, one afternoon. We drove down to the northeast tip of Tennessee and spent the night. Woke up early the next morning to finish our drive. And uh, woke up, there was snow on the ground and... and uh, I, that, you know, wasn't too bad. I, we had a four-wheel drive, and, and so uh, we got in, and really the whole south-central part of the U.S. was hit that year with just a massive ice storm. And the farther we traveled, the worse it got. And I remember at one point we were on Interstate 40, and, and I couldn't even see the accident uh, that caused us to just be literally stopped. And I was stopped in the left-hand lane, I had an 18-wheeler to my right and a guardrail to my left, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and here came a Ford Dooley pickup pulling a, a trailer. And I could tell by the way him and the trailer were zigging and zagging, things weren't good. And uh, I just watched him and told my wife, I said, hold on, we're going to get smashed. And there at the last minute, he hit the median, and I just remember him flying by us and snow going everywhere. And... And uh, it was great. It was great. What an adventure. They ended up closing Interstate 40. We had to go 250 miles out of the way, down to I-20 through Mississippi and, and south. It was, it was brutal. Parts of Louisiana had no power, and, and it's added about eight hours to our trip. And we finally made it there, and, and about the last 10 hours... You know, my wife is sleeping, and my son's sleeping in the back, and I'm driving thinking, is this worth it? You know, going to see my in-laws, is all of this really worth it? I'm going to leave that without a conclusion this morning, but I will tell you that, uh, no, it was worth it. We had a good Christmas, uh, drove home. I remember as we drove through Arkansas, the interstate was then open, just one lane, and they were talking about people being out of power for weeks, not days. It was a rough storm. The whole front of my truck was coated in ice. The only part was the little squares where the headlights were had burned through the ice. But that was quite a detour and not one I really wanted to take. I was thinking also about five years ago. Five years ago this month, my wife and I decided to uh, open our own business, something we'd never done before. And so we bought a building right here in Lakewood and uh, spent several months uh, redoing it, remodeling it, and uh, my wife opened a, a child care center. And I told my wife when we bought the building, I said, this is a nice building, and I know we can make it nice, and I know we can have a nice facility here. I just don't know if we can get people to it. Because it's stuck back in a neighborhood, and uh, not really a, a busy thoroughfare. But we opened in April, and we had a few kids, and, and it, it seemed to be going pretty good. And that was when they were building the hospital up here, St. Anthony's. And they did some work here at the church. They tore up some sewer lines. They had to do all new sewer lines. And so one of the things that they did was right there in front of Belmar Elementary in, on Garrison, they tore up that whole street and literally closed down the street for the whole summer. And they detoured all the traffic on Garrison through the neighborhood, and it went right by my wife's new child care center. And in about three months, we were full and had all the people that we, could, we were licensed to have, all the kids, uh, because of that detour. And sometimes detours that happen in our life turn out to be great. That one certainly did. It was a tremendous blessing that all of a sudden, instead of a few cars coming by our center every day, we had hundreds. And God blessed in that detour. Sometimes detours aren't so great. Sometimes they're a pain, and the weather's bad, like the one I had on that trip to Texas, and they're not good at all. This morning, we want to talk about detours. We're beginning a new series called Disruptive Jesus, and the idea behind it is that sometimes 
Jesus is not on board with our plans. See, we've got plans, we've got ideas, we've got things set out, and sometimes God decides to step in and shake those things up. And it's, most of the time, it's unexpected. And oftentimes, our reaction to it really has a big effect on, on, the, on the benefit or the negative that we see from it. And in Acts chapter 8, we see a, a divine detour, if you will. If we go back to Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. See, this passage of Scripture was brought on because the new church at Jerusalem was growing incredibly fast. And what happened was there came a complaint where the Hellenist Jews, these Jews who were not as orthodox as as maybe the other Jews, these Jews who had integrated more into Greek and then now Roman life, they had come to Christ and they were part of the church. But one of the ministries of the church was that the church would feed and provide for widows that were within the church. And so these, these Hellenist Jews, they, they began to complain and they said, listen, our widows are being neglected. They're not, they're, they're not getting the food that they need, the care that they need, and, and the church isn't providing in the way that they should, that it should. And so the disciples, because they were the ones who were doing all this work, the church was growing by thousands of people, they couldn't keep up. It wasn't that they, they were being discriminatory. They just they couldn't keep up. And so they said, let's get some guys. Let's get some guys who can help out, and we'll do what we're supposed to do, which is pray and, and study the Word so that we can do our ministry. And so the Bible goes on in Acts chapter 6 and verse number 5 and says, The saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, And Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. You go on the rest of chapter 6 and chapter 7 of Acts deals primarily with this man, Stephen. The Bible says Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He would would proclaim Jesus Christ. He would preach him in the temple areas. He He would talk to people about him so much so that they arrested him and he stood before the high priest. He uh, began to declare Jesus Christ to them. Uh, Most of Acts chapter 7 is his sermon before the high priest and the people. His, His message angered the people so much that the Bible says they were full of rage. And they grabbed Stephen by force, this mob. They drug him out of the city and they stoned him. They literally picked up rocks and threw them on them and smashed his body with rocks until he was dead. He was the first martyr for the cause of Christ, this man, Stephen, this one who the Bible says was full of the Holy Spirit and who was set aside by the Holy Spirit to be a servant to widow women. But because of his testimony, he was killed. And so it brings us to our text this morning in Acts chapter 8. It says, At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. We'll talk about Saul next week, but I want us to talk about the man found in chapter 4, or excuse me, verse 3, verse Verse 4 of chapter 8. I'll get there eventually. It says, Therefore those were scattered, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. See, in that listing in Acts chapter 6, it lists these men who were set aside for service. There was Stephen, and the next one listed is Philip. 
Well, Stephen was just killed. Now imagine Philip. He's a guy, he, he comes to faith in Christ, he's a part of the church, had, apparently has some kind of leadership skills, he's well respected, and then he is set apart by the leading of the Holy Spirit. They said, listen, we want to give you uh, 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 some responsibility, a ministry, you have a ministry to these widow women. And so the indication is that Philip is a man, uh, a devout man of God. He's serving these women. He's doing what God has called him to do. He's taking care of their needs. He's making sure that they're fed. And then literally all havoc breaks loose in Jerusalem. His friend, his fellow deacon, Stephen is killed. And Philip has to flee Jerusalem. He has to leave behind these ladies who probably couldn't travel on their own. Later we'll see in the book of Acts that the saints who were left at Jerusalem were in great distress, so much so that the other churches took up an offering to try to help them because of the situation they were in. And so Philip has to leave behind his ministry and he goes to Samaria. Samaria was a place not far from Jerusalem. Christ had visited there. He had an interaction there with the woman at the well. But it was a place where really the Samaritans were half-breeds. Not fully Gentile, but they they were part Jewish. They were half-breeds. And they had uh, kind of come up with their own uh, version of Judaism, if you will. They didn't worship at the temple. They built their own temple. Uh, They worshiped Jehovah God, but not in the way that the Hebrews did. Not in the way that God had designed for them. And... There was great animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans. They weren't weren't, uh, pure in their bloodline. They didn't worship God the right way at the right place. So because of that, the Samaritans responded by hating the Jews. It's a natural reaction, right? I mean, they think they're so much better than us. They think they've got it figured out when really... What we're doing is fine. And and there was great animosity between the two, so much so that the average Jew would not even travel through the area of Samaria. They would reroute. They'd set their GPS to go around Samaria because they didn't even want to go through the place. They hated them. And so here this man, Philip, goes to Samaria, and he preaches the word. And so in verse five it says, or verse six it says, and the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. What a remarkable detour that God gave to this man, Philip, who's ministering there in Jerusalem, doing what the Holy Spirit has called and be, called him to do, but because of persecution, he goes to Samaria, and so he naturally proclaims the word of God, and revival breaks out. I mean, people uh, who are demonically possessed are, are healed. He's casting out spirits. People who are lame, they can't walk. They're paralyzed. They're being healed. The Bible says people were responding and there was great joy. What a ministry God had given to Philip through this detour. And so he's there, he's ministering, and there's great results. And then we have a story in Acts chapter 8 about a sorcerer, but if you skip down to verse 26... It says, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go to the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Philip's in Jerusalem doing what God has called him to do. Persecution comes and he goes to Samaria. He preaches the word again. Revival breaks out. People are being healed. All kinds of great things are happening. So much so that the man who had kind of had a, a, 
a leadership in the city, this sorcerer, Simon, he comes to Christ. I mean, Philip has got a tremendous ministry there in Samaria. There's great joy, the Bible says. And then the God, through this angel, directs him and says, you should go to the desert. What? There's nobody in the desert. I'm preaching here to hundreds of people, thousands of people, and God is working. And you want me to go to the desert? He doesn't say, well, go to the desert because I've got something special to do. He doesn't even tell him what he's got to do. He just says what? Go to the desert. That's not a detour that most of us would like to take. I've driven through the desert. West Texas, Arizona. There's a certain beauty to the desert that I can appreciate but not for very long. You know what I'm saying? I mean, maybe you like the hot weather or an oven. Those two things are kind of what I equate with the desert. Well, it's a dry heat, but it's 200 degrees. It doesn't matter. You feel like beef jerky because you dry out. I don't like the desert. I remember driving through Arizona one time and you're just driving for miles and miles and miles and it's nothing. And out in the middle of nowhere, there's like a little house. And I thought, what mob witness protection program guy lives there? You know? I mean, who lives there? And where do they, where do they buy groceries, man? We've been on this road for 100 miles. And the angel of the Lord calls Philip to the desert, calls him away from his successful ministry, calls him away from this people who, can you imagine, I mean, think with me for a moment. How do you think Philip is treated in Samaria? There's the guy who helped my son to be able to walk again. There's the guy who cast the demon out of my uncle who was oppressed by that spirit for years. There's the guy who, through his message, I received Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's great joy in Samaria. Why? From the message that Philip brought. Probably a pretty good situation, don't you think? I mean, even Simon the sorcerer, who had been this leader, now just wants to follow Philip around and try to learn from him. He was misguided in that, and you can read the story on your own, but I'll tell you what, there was great respect that Philip had in Samaria. And God was working. There was work for him to do. But God, through the angel, said, go to the desert. Can I submit to you today that oftentimes I think we want to follow Christ only where we want to go. And that's not following. That's not following. But that's really the way we are. See, if, if, if Christ will give me comfort, if Christ will, will take me where I want to go, then, that, then I want to follow him. That's not following. That's just walking behind somebody on a, de- on a path you've already determined you're going to go on. And the, the move that Philip made, the detour that he took, made absolutely zero sense to man. But God had a plan. And God had a plan for this detour. This is desert, he says in verse 26. And verse 27 says, so he arose and went. He didn't discuss it with the angel. He didn't pray about it. He didn't get a focus group together. He didn't make a pros and cons list. He arose and he went. God told him what to do, so he went. There's probably a lesson there for us. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. 
So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? Goes on in verse 31. And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and to sit with him. And the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led, like a sh- led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. The Bible says that Philip went to the desert and he meets a man, an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, that's an interesting description. Um, Some words that that, uh, describing a person that we wouldn't typically use today. Ethiopian, uh, even even that description among scholars, there's some uh, some disagreements. Some things, uh, some scholars say, well, this was probably a Jewish man who was born and from Ethiopia. Others would say, no, he was a, a, an African man uh, who who literally came up from Ethiopia. I think. Uh, my preference is just to accept the Bible at its word. He was an Ethiopian. That's what the Bible says. But he, he apparently had some exposure to Judaism because he came to Israel seeking God. And then the Bible says he was a eunuch. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, was literally a man who was castrated. Now, I've never met a eunuch that I know of and if I did, I don't think he was advertising it. That's not something that's real common in, a, in our day and age. Interesting, the um, history about that. That was absolutely forbidden under Jewish law uh, to man or animals. But uh, it was common in that day and age, and oftentimes they would take a servant, they would castrate them because then they felt like they were no threat. They could have them be a servant to the queen or to minister to to ladies because now this guy wasn't uh, a threat in a sexual manner. Also, a a man who was castrated would not have any children, so he wasn't a threat to take over the kingdom and, and, you know, start his own dynasty because he wasn't going to start a a family. And so a, a eunuch was often made a eunuch to be a trusted servant. And so uh, a a person who was a eunuch was often looked at as a trusted servant. And in this case, apparently very much so. Because the Bible says that for Candace the queen, he was the man in charge of all of the treasury. He was the money man. It's interesting that, that the study that I did, the scholars that I read, said that this uh, Ethiopian empire, which is, uh, only barely touches modern-day Ethiopia, but was in Africa, was the dominant empire in Africa at that time. And this guy is in charge of all the money. So when we read this passage and we think about this man in a chariot, you might kind of envision Philip walking over sand, seeing a horse and a chariot and a man in it. Probably not the case at all. A man of this stature would not have traveled alone. He, he would have had uh, some kind of, of guard with him, uh, military men to protect him, others who would serve him. He was a servant, but he would have others who would serve him. He's there reading the scripture. The Bible says that Philip came up next to him. He probably didn't drive his own chariot. He had a chauffeur who would carry him around. This this was probably some kind of a caravan that had gone to Jerusalem and was now headed back to Africa. Interesting, too, that this man made this long journey to Jerusalem to the temple, to try to find God. 
He apparently had the money to purchase a copy of a part of the scriptures, at least the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, where this passage is found that Philip preaches to him about. And yet the indication is he is returning unfulfilled. He's still searching the scriptures, still trying to understand. And Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? And the man's response is, how can I? He had gone to the temple. He had, he had seen all, I mean, he'd gone to the very heart of, of, of Judaism, of Jehovah worship. He had the very scriptures, the very words of God in his hand, and yet he is traveling back home unfulfilled not finding what he was looking for. But the Bible says that Philip joins himself to the man and it begins at the scripture and preaches to him Jesus. Maybe he had heard of this Jesus when he was there at the temple. Maybe he had heard the rumors, perhaps even ran into a few of the disciples. We don't know. But apparently... He hadn't heard the gospel in the way that Philip was able to proclaim it to him. And so he asked the first question of Philip in Acts chapter 8 and verse 31. He says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. He said to Philip, you know what? Why don't you come show me the scriptures? He was open to the guidance of Philip. Verses 32, we see the beginnings of question number two. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? He asked him the second question, what's this mean? What does this mean? Who is he talking about? What is the fulfillment of scripture? How can I understand this? And verse 35 says that Philip opened his mouth and beginning at that scripture preached to him Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul writing to Timothy said, And that from a childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Listen, the good news is the place to start is with the Bible. This man was on the right track. He had gone to the temple. Maybe he had seen the Pharisees and the Sadducees at work. He had seen the ritualism, but he didn't find God there. But he got a copy of the scriptures. And as he read it, he wanted to know. And God revealed it to him through this man, Philip. He said, the answer is Jesus. The prophet Isaiah, who did prophesy of himself, but ultimately spoke of the the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus. And the Bible tells us, that the scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. And then he asks a third question in verse 36. This is the question I wanted us to get to this morning. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. It's interesting as a note, we don't really see Philip again until Acts chapter 21. He's still at Caesarea. He has a family, four daughters, and he's known as Philip the Evangelist. Philip the Evangelist. 
But I want us to see and I want to close with the question that the Ethiopian eunuch asked asked in Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. Because as they travel, Philip declares to him Jesus. He gives him the gospel that Jesus Christ has come to fulfill Scripture. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come lived a perfect life, died a death that he did not deserve, but did not stay in the grave, but rose again to show victory over death and victory over sin. And Jesus Christ has come that if you will put your faith and your trust in him, you will be saved. You will have forgiveness from your sin. Eternal life, and as Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, Life abundant. And the Ethiopian man, hearing this message and understanding that the first step, the first commandment of any new believer, any new person in Christ, is to identify with Christ through baptism, stops his chariot and says, right there is water. What stops me from being baptized? Why can't I follow Jesus? And Philip said, if you believe, you can. And he was baptized. And my question to you this morning is this. What stops you from following God? What plans, what ideas that you have stop you from following God? Is it our pride? Is it fear that God will lead us someplace we don't really want to go? Can I tell you then we don't trust God if we won't follow Him? And I think many of us spend a little time in prayer and come to church, but really when push comes to shove and the detour comes, we're unwilling to follow him. What hinders you? What stops you from following God? You may be here this morning and you may have heard the gospel presented before. You may know that you need to accept Christ as your Savior, but you have resisted that. And my question to you this morning is, what stops you from following after God? Is it your pride? Is it your guilt? Is it fear? Can I tell you, none of those things, none of those things are good excuses. Because God desires to give you a spirit that overcomes fear. He said if you will humble yourself before Him, He will lift you up. And can I tell you, that trust in yourself is foolishness compared to putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Because we are weak and frail and faulty, but God is almighty and all-powerful and holy. And I would much rather have Him guide me than me try to guide myself. What is stopping you this morning from being saved? Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What stops you today? Some of you are here and you've taken that step of faith, you've put your trust in Christ, and you've never been baptized. The first command that God gives to us to publicly identify with Him. And my question to you this morning is this. What stops you from being baptized? See, here is water. That's what the Ethiopian man said. Well, I don't know if I'm ready. Have you trusted Christ? Do you believe? It's not a long list of prerequisites that Philip gives to this man. I want to challenge you this morning. Uh, We've been praying for over a month about this date. 
I believe there's somebody, I, we've got a couple of guys who are scheduled to be baptized this morning, but I believe there's others here this morning that have never taken that step of faith. Can I tell you, we got shorts, we got shirts, we got towels, we got water, it's warm. What stops you this morning from being baptized, from following after God? Maybe you're here and God has put it on your heart to do something. Maybe it's a career change. Maybe it's a ministry. Maybe it's another level of commitment to Him. And you have resisted that. And my challenge to you this morning is this. What stops you from serving God? Great wisdom from this man from Ethiopia. When he saw that water, he said, what is stopping me from following after God? And the answer was nothing. Nothing. And he didn't care what his entourage thought. He didn't care about the schedule he had to keep. He didn't care about anything else. The Bible says that he got down out of his chariot. I imagine he took off some of these expensive garments that he had. He waded down into the water with this man who had just explained to him Christ, and he was baptized. Why? Because this is what he had been searching for, and he recognized the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. And my challenge to you this first Sunday of 2015 is what is standing in your way from doing what God is calling you to do.